All right, we've talked about discipleship and evangelism. <coughs> Excuse me, and evangelism. And now let's talk about ministry. Ministry is serving others for their benefit. Notice that last part, for their benefit. Um, that means that when somebody um, somebody does me harm, I have to not ask how to make myself feel better. I have to ask what is their what would benefit them. See what I mean? When we say something real, with a real nasty attitude, what would benefit them? See what I mean? Um, so, uh, if I'm doing it for their benefit, then it doesn't matter how I am treated. See, because that emphasis is no longer on you, it's on them. Uh, Matthew 10, verse 24, says... And verse 24, the student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. Um, you know, as, as sometimes when we're ministering, we take it personally when somebody rejects the gospel. It's not about you or your kingdom. I mean, they're rejecting God, not you. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so in other words, you are simply the tool. You have no right to get offended in this. Um, listen to the master's hurt when you are hurt. Think about that. Uh, what did Jesus do when he was hurt? And what does what does God do uh, when 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 something happens that causes uh, that causes hurt? Well, do that. Um, you see what I mean? Instead of comparing yourselves by yourselves or comparing yourself, you know, to those not just yourself but to those around you. Um, instead, compare yourself to God and ask yourself, how did he respond in these situations? Jesus was in Nazareth, and, and pretty much everybody rejected him there. He couldn't even do very many miracles there. Um, so, I mean, what did Jesus do? So, I mean, always always go back to that. Well, how, how, how would God want me to respond in a situation? The ministry of the church is serving God, doing what he wants, that's foremost. Secondly, it's reaching the lost, which is what he wants. And making disciples of the saved. See that 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 is our that is the church's not just my church. I mean that's the church's purpose. Okay. Um, cults will usually um, have somebody at the top who gets all the money and that kind of stuff, and it's usually for power, or money, or something like that. It's n it's never just for you know obviously for the kingdom's sake. <clears throat> Please excuse me. <clears throat> Matthew 22, 36 through um, 40 says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Uh, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. In Acts 2, 42... Um, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Hebrews 10.25. You know, sometimes it's not always either or, or sometimes it's both and. You know, like some people read the gospel accounts and they get all... Oh no, there's, you know, there's, they don't record the exact same thing in the exact same details. That means it's wrong. Well, no, it doesn't mean either or. Either this uh, gospel is right or this gospel is right. Sometimes it's both and. They both elaborate on different aspects of something. That doesn't mean that one's right or wrong. It's just that they had a reason for why they were writing, and they recorded those things that were actually relevant to what they were saying. They were not trying to record everything, and they weren't were trying to only record certain uh, or trying to record every detail, but only the, those details that actually made sense for what they were trying to say. Um, never forget that usually the the way that a word, something is worded in, in scripture is worded that way on purpose. So um, Hebrews 10:25 says. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Um, so, ministries are how the body accomplishes its ministry. Sunday services, young adult meetings, Bible studies. We don't teach to, to teach. We don't teach lessons. We teach people. I read that in um, 
Creative Bible Teaching by uh, Richards and Redfield. Wow, that changed just changed the whole thought. We don't teach lessons; we teach people, and and, and that's exact same thing. Same thing with uh, ministry. Um, we don't have these services, you know, and 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 all these different things to have them. We have them for people. So if they're not meeting people's needs. They're, it's not worth having. Sunday school, for instance. In today's society, it's kind of being outgraded. People don't – the next generation doesn't want to get up that early. Um, and if you go, are anywhere, you know, in, like where I am, where, where – <coughs> there's a, a, large, a large rate of people who don't have jobs and that kind of things. And they're not, there's no reason why they're going to get up on Sunday mornings that early. I'm just saying. Um, also, Sunday morning services are maybe being a little bit, I don't want to say dated, but not sufficient. Um, we may, The church may want to start thinking about having church services on different days of the week as well, um, not just Sunday. Uh, and the reason why I say this is because more and more people are working on Sundays and half off other days, uh, Mondays or Tuesdays, for instance. So it may be of more benefit to think about having multiple weeks where you have services. Just an idea. Um, I'm not saying get rid of the Sunday service by all means. No, then you'll then you'll ostracize those people who have been a part of the church for a long time. You don't want to do that. You don't want to pick between either of these group of people or this group of people. You want to say our ministry is to the people. So um, you obviously want to do do ministries that are actually accomplish something. Um, is God calling you to a special area of service? That that is something that, that you can always ask yourself. Um, you know, uh, oh, we don't have a young young adults group. Well, do you have that on your heart to start it? I remember how we started ours. Is I went to the pastor and I said, hey, um, I would like to do this, and I and I already have the plan made out. I already have everything that I know know to do. This is how it is. You have any questions? Let me know. I I, I, I wanted to do it, and so I showed him that I that I wanted to do it, and uh, he looked over my plan. We talked about it, and he said, yeah, we'll do it. So, I mean, it's, it's that doing ministries that are actually for people, not just doing ministries and, and having people work for the ministry. You're having the ministry work for people. So, um, some, sometimes, it, sometimes it's necessary to put some ministries on the, just to outdate them. Like Sunday school in, in a lot of churches is becoming that. Now, I would like to give a big word of caution. Make sure that you are outdating things that actually need to be outdated in pl so that you can replace it with ministries that are needed. Okay, let me kind of explain here. The Sunday night service is a great opportunity because a lot of times people are working for Sunday mornings and so they can only make it to the night service or you know this or that. Or sometimes people just like to be in church twice a day. So we should have the opportunity for them but and for those people who can't come on Sunday mornings. But what we've started doing is we've started not having Sunday night services and still having Sunday morning services and not making up the difference anywhere. So where are you on Sunday night? Oh, I'm watching a football game. Well, I mean, no offense to football, but if you're the pastor, I mean, goodness sakes, we need to be showing people that, that, that the doors are always open. We need to present and give people opportunities. And if you take away from some one area, make sure that you're that, that it's for a reason. And you may want to think about reinvesting that new time into something else. Like maybe um, um, go ahead and get rid of Sunday night service, but then start like a Tuesday morning service or something. I don't know. Just, you know, think about it. You don't have to do the same thing that you've always done. Just... Make sure that you're not just slacking off in ministry, that you are giving it your full effort. I, I know a lot of times when we do ministry, we get, especially in smaller churches, that there'll be like, there won't be people to do it. And so what we'll do is we'll know that we really are the only person who can do the job. And so we kind of do it lazy. We don't show up on time. Um, and in fact, I had a boss once that said, if you show up on time, you're late. You expected us there 15 minutes early. That's fair, I think. I mean, if you if you're there when when start time is, you're not going to be ready. You're going to be getting ready while everybody else is going. If you're there 15 minutes early, you can get ready and then actually start work at the time. Um, but I mean, it's it's kind of the same kind of the same thing there. Um, anyways, I'm back on topic, I guess. Matthew 28:19. I already read, read this before. Go and make disciples of all nations. Um, you know, is it is it in your power to do something? Uh, let's look at this next point. What skills, natural talents, belongings, money, for instance, uh, passions? Um, I have a passion for orphans. Do I have that can be invested in others? 
do I have something that can actually be that can actually be done? Hey, I have I have a Tuesday afternoon that, that, that's completely free. Why don't we start a a, um, a a prayer service on Tuesday afternoons? Da. So I mean, you had the the ability to do it. It was a good thing to do. Ask the pastor and see what happens. Is it biblical? Is it needed? And am I able to do it? Not just, oh, well, I, I, I lost my job, so now I can do it. I mean, because then when if you get another job, <laughs> you're not going to be able to do it anymore. So once again, you, you want to make sure that it's something that, that's, that's, that's within your power to do that is makes sense for you to do. Um, not necessarily am I able as in my own strength, but as in within my power, okay? Um, for instance, um, you can you, it's within your power to give money to orphans. Um, not really something about your own strength. Um, I'll give you another example. Oh, I've, I I would love to start to start an orphanage, but I just don't think I'd be able to be used in that way. Well, if that's actually something that God's calling you to do, He will provide for that, and He will He will guide you in that. But the difference is, oh, I'm just so um, so good with kids, and I I'm great at starting businesses. Or see, what I mean, it's it's about the heart is what I'm getting at, and I maybe not said that in the clearest way, but um, that's really what I'm getting at. <clears throat> Are there any open doors? This is a question you can ask yourself. Are there, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> are there any open doors? Is there a place where this is needed but that you could actually feel? <clears throat> like I said with the with the young adults uh, thing. Um, Exodus 31. I already gave reference to that earlier about um, Bezalel and Aholiab. Exodus 31, 1 through 6, if you want to read that. Um, but, uh, I'll read it. Um, Exodus 31. Um, 1 through 6. The Lord said uh, to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the, son of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skill, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze. So he had set him aside for this. He had empowered him with that. See, see what I mean? It's not necessarily um, something of, of strength. And you're just going to have to uh, do a scripture study and, and, and cross the bridge when you come there to, to decide the difference between skill and and being spirit led and spirit empowered. Um, Second <clears throat> Corinthians twelve nine. Second Corinthians twelve nine says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Okay. Lead by example in your service of others uh, and worship of God. That's just a, that's just a good a good a good principle. Paul once wrote, "Follow after me as I follow after Christ." Lead by example in your service of others and worship of God. For instance, um, in, in leading worship, um, sometimes worship leaders will say, oh, clap and do this and all kinds of different stuff, but they don't do it. See, so the thing is, you can only expect those who follow you to do what you do. You can't ever expect them. Sometimes they will, but it's not. It, you shouldn't expect it of them to go above and beyond of what you do. So with that being said, I mean, think about your kids. Oh, uh, telemarketer calls. Oh, no, tell them I'm not here. So you're telling your kid to lie, and then when your kid lies to you, See, lead by example. You set the tone as a leader. You set the atmosphere. Okay. Does your church have a problem with um, poor communication? So make sure that you communicate. Um, does your church have a problem with um, financial waste? So make sure that you don't waste finances. Um, see what I mean? You want to make sure in all these different things that you're leading by example. Not just in your service of others, but also in your worship of God. So, um, <clears throat> submit yourself to authority. A leader who is his or her own authority rejects God's authority for their own. I mean, I don't know if there's any other way to say that. A leader who who is his or her own authority rejects God's authority for their own. 
In other words, my authority is above God's authority. Okay? Because God places people over authority, and you, by saying, okay, I'm not going to church, I'm just going to have a church in my, in my home, you are rejecting that leadership, regardless of whether the leader is right or wrong, that's not even a factor. Um, you are not submitting yourself to your authority. And well, lesson 12 talks more about that, but 1 Peter 3.9 Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you are called so that you may inherit a blessing. Um, John 14.10 Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you I do not speak on my own authority, rather it is the Father living in me who is doing uh, his work. Once again, if even Jesus submitted to his authority, why should you not? Hebrews 13, 17. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. See, we we actually, when we reject authority and that kind of stuff, it's actually bad for us. See, it's not a power struggle. It, it's you are bringing punishment on yourself. So continually grow. Um, continually grow and seek God even if... Uh, even if it's hard. Uh, ministry is only accomplished through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That's something that I already kind of touched on, so I'm not really going to touch on it anymore. Um, but it is important to note. Okay. Uh, the church is a community which reaches outward, upward, and inward. That might sound like, whoa, so let me break it down. The church breaks, uh, reaches outward, do we treat everyone as though they are as important to us as they are to God? Ask yourself that. Am I treating people like God sees them? Okay. Upward. Is everything we do matching up with the statement, God is my God? Or is it matching up with more of the statement of, I am my God and God's my God when it's convenient for me? Um, inward. Do we correctly judge ourselves in motive, action, attitude, and word? Judge ourselves. Be on the guard to, to pull the lock out of your eyes so that you can see clearly to pull the speck out of your brother's eye. Okay? Um, just have discernment there. Um, I hope you're understanding the idea of ministry, the, the mindset of ministry, the attitude, okay, um, about service and about love. Excuse me. Ministry is difficult. If you're in it for, the, for long enough, there will be problems. I don't know um, why they don't teach more of this in, in seminary and those kinds of things for, for new pastors. Uh, ministry is difficult. It's not something for the for the faint of heart, and, and, and you do definitely have things have to have things uh, to keep you from burnout, um, from immorality, uh, and, and adultery, and those kinds of things. Um, it's a lot easier, by the way, if you've got a spouse or something to lean on. Um, if not a spouse, then, then, then something to lean on. I mean, it, it's wow, it's very difficult. Um, so don't be surprised when, when when problems come; they will come. But ministry is more than problems. It's not just a bunch of problems. There there are there are other thing, aspects to ministry. Don't get discouraged at the bad, rumors, attacks, failures, all these different things. Oh, I messed up again. Oh, everybody's attacking me. Everybody hates me. No, it just seems like that at the time. Read through the book of Psalms. A lot of the a lot of the saints felt like that throughout history, but that doesn't mean that it was right. They just okay it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody literally is against you. Um, as long as you are doing as the Lord commanded, uh, they are attacking the Lord, not you. If you are not doing as the Lord commanded you to do, and you're living in your own way, well then you need to change. 
It's not, oh, haters going to hate. Yeah, hey, uh, sometimes that's true, but sometimes we want to go off and do whatever dumb thing we want to do and then say, oh, haters going to hate, um, rather than changing ourselves and allowing ourselves to be conformed to the image of Christ. Um, so make sure you are maintaining a biblical life, not a self-pleasing life, not what you think is a good life, but what the Bible says is a good life. Um, uh, Philippians 4. Philippians 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Um, so... Um, don't ever feel like you are better, smarter, or more spiritual than someone else. That's called pride and sometimes stupidity. Well, eh, yeah. Christians are saved because of grace. Um, I believe the word, the word there is they. Sometimes my computer freaks out here. There we go. Um, therefore, all are equal in the body. Ah, I thought it was going to be they. Ah, it's therefore. Um, Christians are saved because of grace. Therefore, all are equal in the body. So. Oh, well, I'm, I'm just more intellectual than them. Yeah, watch out for that attitude. That's a good way of saying I'm not going to, I'm not actually hearing what the pastor's preaching about because I'm way more smart than him. And that's a good way to fall into sin. So equality with the body does not mean there is not an authority structure. I already mentioned this. Different people have different roles, and that's just how it is. I mean, bad things bad things happen to people who don't understand this. Um, don't try to do ministry. I'm not talking about cursing necessarily. Um, I guess that could happen. But what I'm talking about is um, they just have a problem with authority they, they go from church to church the people usurp their authority it, it's always comes to a surprise to me when people don't submit to the authority in their lives and then they're surprised that their kids don't submit to their authority that always surprises me why would you expect your kids to do what not even you are doing i mean that's just not you shouldn't expect that of them. sometimes they will but you shouldn't expect it of them so uh, don't try to do ministry by yourself or without the Holy Spirit. By yourself, being in that, oh no, I've got this ministry covered, I don't need your help. Somebody comes alongside, oh no, I started this ministry by myself, I can see it through. Or, you know, um, oh well, you don't, you didn't want to help me when I first started out, I don't want your help now. I mean, obviously I hope you see the insincerity and just stupidity in those statements. So don't try to do ministry by yourself. And also, don't try to do it without the Holy Spirit. That's a good way of, of perfecting the art of talking with no, pur no purpose, because the Holy Spirit's not leading it, no purpose. You don't have to and shouldn't attempt building a home alone, right? Would everybody would agree with me on that? This ministry is the exact same thing. There is no substitute for the Holy Spirit. Even even Paul used uh, had other people who helped him on stuff, so. Um, James 3.16 For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. Um, Genesis 2.18 The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Obviously, he's talking about the wife here, but I think that the principle does apply. It's not good for man to be alone. Acts 1.8.
But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power when... Um, no matter how important you are, you need to depend on Christ daily. Sometimes when we're in ministry, we get the idea that, oh no, people really need me, I'm really important. And we kind of just forget where we came from. We kind of just forget where we came from. We end up like King David up in his tower when, when, he, sin when he sinned against Bathsheba uh, in 1 Samuel 12 or somewhere around there. Um, 2 Samuel 12. Sorry, 2 Samuel 12. Um, he, you know, he's at, he's just chilling out in his castle, and he forgot, you know, that he was nothing more than, more than, uh, he was just taking care of sheep. That's all. And now he was king over the nation, and he kind of forgot, you know, where he came from, what his responsibility was. So, no matter how important you are, actual or perceived, you uh, still need to depend on Christ daily. Even Christ had to separate himself for renewal. How much more so are you? You are never too because he was fully God. Remember, you are never too busy or too needed to not seek after the Lord. You are never too busy or too needed to not seek after the Lord. Have regular scheduled vacations and a day of rest in the week to ensure you don't you don't push yourself too hard spiritually or emotionally. Also, make sure that you're not signing up for too many things. I mean, that's actually a real danger. Matthew 14, 23 um, says, uh, After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountain um, side by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and stop there. Um, but I think you see what I'm saying. So just some final thoughts. God can use anything to form us to the image of Christ. Um, I'm not going to say that everything in your life was ordained by God. I'm not going to say that. That's just nonsense. If, let's say, you were um, raped as a child or, or you know, somehow uh, abused maybe by a parent or that kind of situation, um, I, I'm, I'm not going to say that, that, that God was cool with that. I'm not going to say that at all. I'm not going to say that God ordained that. But he can use it. He can use anything to conform us to the image of Christ to, to, to change our heart. So, um, we are of the same body if we follow the same God. We cannot be united with other religions. Um, we can be united with other denominations, not other religions. There's a big difference. Um, for instance, Jehovah's Witness, different religion, not a different denomination. Muslim, different religion, not a different denomination. See, the, the church tends to sway too much to extremes. Before, if you remember, it was, um, we couldn't, we can't be with anyone. You know, after the Reformation, it was all, uh, all hands on deck, I guess, whatever. And everybody did w just, you know, with their different opinions, go, goes to extremes. Now there's like hundreds of denominations. But remember that before that, there was just the one church, okay? Remember that. And so... Um, now, in our generation now, they're seeing all this discord and disunity in the church, and now they're going to the other extreme. Um, you know, because it's all love and grace now, and so we need to accept anybody who even knows anything about Jesus remotely. Okay, except that's not what the Bible says. See you know what I mean? Like, either extreme isn't good. What we try to do is... Somebody does something dumb, and so we respond and take it to the other extreme and think that it's better. Like, for instance, for the longest time, women weren't even people. They were just kind of things, maybe objects if you want to even call them that. They were just kind of there. Men didn't respect them at all. So now um, we have the feminist movement, which has taken that stupid thing that men did and tried to match them with stupidity. So men were really stupid, and so now women, you want to be stupid too? I mean, I don't, I don't get that. There is a balance there. Feminism isn't about making women equal. It's about making them superior. See, it does the exact same thing. And they'll tell you things like, oh, no, no, we're trying to be equal with men. But that's not actually what they believe. If you actually follow uh, what feminist stuff does, it tries to establish that women are superior. And women aren't superior. Men aren't superior. They're equal. It, it's that simple. It's not like it's something that needs to be spit, once again, blown out of context. They, for some reason, Christians have a really hard time with balance, right in the middle. They always have to go to one extreme or the other. 
Um, like, are you Republican or Democrat? Well, what if I don't like either of those choices? <laughs> Anyways, I, I don't like to get into politics because my job is not to be a politician. My job is to be a religious leader. So, um, we can't be united with Mormons, Hindus, Buddhists. We can't be united with these because uh, united uh, because they are different religions. There's only one way to the Father, and that's Jesus. Um, so, do they believe in the same Bible? Do they believe in the same God? No? Well, then no. Final absolute truth is in the Bible revealed, I believe, by, yeah, revealed to us by God himself. We need to be real careful about putting our authority uh, over God's. Um, John 14, 6 says the thing about um, Jesus being the only way. Um, and there's other places, too. I just think that that's the one that's most clear, most straightforward. Um, that way I don't have to read a long passage or something like that and go into exegesis and that kind of stuff. Um, so just remember that there is a, there is a, there is a middle branch there. Um, like, for so long, the church has been homophobic. And now... Or, or the whole nonsense with the Confederate flag. Like, I cannot tell you how much I don't care. I just don't care. But in ministry, you have to realize that other people do care. And so whereas I could not care any less about the flag, I really could not care any less. It's over. Move on. You know what I mean? But obviously there are other people who would say, no, it's, you know, history and this different things. And, um, you know, and for those people I understand, and, and it's my job not to pass judgment so much as help them um, you know, help them to to love people. You know, but once again, going to the going to a balance. You don't have to be against the flag. You don't have to be for that flag. The Confederate flag is what I'm talking about. Um, the whole thing with the homosexual marriage. You don't have to be for or against. Um, let me say this in a different way because I know this is going to be taken out of context. Christians for a long time said, okay, we just hate. Homosexuals, like there's sin and then there's homosexuality, which is just the absolute worst of worsts. I'm going to struggle with. I, I'm not going to be faithful to my wife, but I don't want homosexuals to marry. So I mean, I'm not. I'm going to look at porn when my wife's away, but yet when a man wants to marry another man, that's where I draw the line. Both are not being biblical. God does not condone homosexuality. I'm not denying that. But he also does not condone uh, a husband being unfaithful. See, I mean, we try to justify our sins and, and then condemn other people's sins. Well, no. And I will admit that there are there are some sins are worse than others. I'm not, I'm not denying that at all. All equally separate us from God. Every sin separates us from God. But some sins are worse than others. I'm not, I'm not denying that. But what we've done is we've become homophobic throughout the years. And so now that our culture is ultra love homosexuals, I mean, there, are, there aren't even any standards anymore. There's just, you know, hey, you have to love everybody unless you stand for something and then you can't love that. Well, that doesn't make sense either. You know, oh, we're not going to tolerate people who are intolerable. Why don't you look up hypocrisy in the Bible and, I mean, sorry, in the, in the dictionary and that would definitely show you exactly what you're saying. See, it doesn't work to, to be intolerable to intoler intolerance. See what I mean? Um, I hope you understand what I'm saying here. So what, what am I saying? Is homosexuality a sin? Yes, very clearly it's a sin. Duh. I mean, that's really... What is marriage? Marriage is a... Um, what is it called? Um, well, just say unity between a man, one man and one woman. And that that's what marriage is. So ultimately, um, homosexuality is, is is a sin and that kind of stuff. But I want you to realize one, one more thing. Um, I don't want to ease off here. Homosexuality is a sin, and homosexual marriage is just you you you're redefining something by definition. That's not even marriage anymore. I, I don't understand why they couldn't just why the why the first of all, I don't even understand why the government gets its fingers in as much as it does. Anyways. Um, I'm not really one for big government myself. I mean, I know other people may be, but um, I don't understand why this was a government issue. I, I really don't. Um, I, I'm pretty sure... Well, that's getting a little bit off topic. Um, but... 
there are some sins that we struggle with our whole life. If you will, they are we are born with some sins, if you will. Not necessarily from the womb, but I mean things happen in our lives that make it hard for us to deal with something. One person could, st could struggle with alcoholism, for instance, and they will never be able to go into a bar and not drink, or I'm sorry, not get drunk. That was just never going to happen for them. See what I mean? But, in, and in the same way, there are some people who will struggle with homosexuality. Maybe they'll always be attracted to the same sex. But remember, being attracted to something doesn't make it okay, though. Well, I'm married, and I find someone else attractive, so I'm going to go have sex with that other, other person. Well, no, you're married. Well, no, no, you just said that, see what I mean? It's the same kind of idea there. Um, hey, I just saw a six-year-old little girl, and I, I'm attracted to her, so I'm going to go have sex with her. See what I mean? It, attraction does not justify something. But what's happened is the church has not defined what it is to be a man or a woman. So women think that they're think that oh I'm a, I, 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 there's a man stuck inside me. No, you just have a few things. You not a few things. You enjoy doing some things that that maybe are seen as more manly, but that doesn't make you a man. Um, I know a guy who likes to um, to um, knit. Or crochet. I think it's crochet. Does that make him a girl? Well, no. He just likes doing something that's traditionally seen as a little bit more effeminate. There's nothing really necessarily wrong with that. Homosexuality, by definition, is partaking of sexual activity with someone of the same sex. Being tempted is not a sin. Jesus was tempted by um, by Satan. Okay, He didn't sin. See what I mean? Being tempted to lust after the same sex is not a sin. It's a sin when you lust or when you partake. One of the versions of the NIV put it like this. If you, if for the person who practices homosexuality, and people threw a fit about it because they didn't understand what they were saying, but I definitely do understand what they were saying. They were trying to say, just because you feel like you're born with a sin doesn't mean that you will always struggle with it, and it doesn't mean that it's okay, neither of those things. Some people are homosexual because of things that have happened to them, okay? In which case, you need to you need to do what you can to restore the relationship between your parents, if you can. Do what you can to forgive those who have wronged you. Do what you can to let go of the past, and 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 surround yourself with with same sex with the people with the people of the same sex that you are, and that will help you um, to see them as, as you don't have to do that. But then so sometimes um, we go to uh, homosexuality because we're in other sexual immorality. We look at porn and we keep doing that, so we get into things like child abuse or, or homosexuality. And obviously um, people would say, oh, you're equating those two sins. Well, understand what I'm saying here. Um, I'm saying in God's sight, not in society's sight. A sin is a sin. Um, but then there's other people who weren't necessarily born with it uh, well, I think I kind of already explained that. So, uh, where should we stand on homosexuality? It, we should stand with that, with this. Yes, it is wrong. There are standards. Okay, there is there is a way of living, and that doesn't conform to God's way of living. Okay, remember God's the lawmaker, not man. So, God set this way of. of now, I'm not saying you shouldn't follow the laws of the land. You'd be surprised how many times people take things out of context. So should you uphold that homosexuality is wrong? Yes. Should you be afraid of homosexuals? No. Should you hate homosexuals? No. It's not like it's catching. Oh no, he's gonna. I'm around a homosexual. I have to wash my hands. No, it's not like that at all. Goodness sakes. A homosexual is someone, especially you know, there are Christians who are who are who think that they're homosexuals. There are that is something that happens. We have to redefine what, or not redefine as in change the definition, but define again because our culture has lost the definition of what it is to be a man and what it is to be a woman. So for so long, men try so hard to live up to this expectation of them of what a man is, and they just get lost and confused. It, it's this simple. Well, it was this simple. It used to. If you had a penis, you were you were a man, and if you didn't, you were a woman. Now it's it's you know people get sex changes and those kinds of things. What makes you a man or a woman is your chromosome count. That that's it. Okay, just because you have it, you have a more um, leader mentality does not mean that you are a man, and does not mean that. It, and just because you have more of uh, effeminate qualities, maybe um, doesn't mean you are a woman. Okay. 
just want to clarify that. And see, the church hasn't clarified that. The church has just assumed that, that, that the culture knows this, and they're just letting the culture dictate, the, dictate how things are. The church used to stand for things in a loving way and, and mold things. The church used to be at, 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 the, at, the, at the forefront. Christians used to be at the forefront of science. Now, uh, you know, the, the, theory of, um, the theory of evolution, um, and, and Christians go, go running for the hills. I mean, goodness sakes. The past 100, 200 years of, of Christianity has not been good. But how do we change that? By what we do right now. Right now, we are molding the church of tomorrow. It's not like the church of tomorrow is going to suddenly appear when the youth become the pastors. That's not what's going to happen. We are changing and molding society. We are changing and molding the church now. Right now. See, we become obscure. The church doesn't really answer any of the world's actual problems and concerns. The church just kind of lives to tell everybody else you know, how evil they are. And that kind of stuff. We need to be careful. They were actually establishing what the church is about, and we're actually making an impact on the community in a good way, not in a bad way. I know some people have the idea that we're supposed to, like, um, you know, take over society, and they, oh, I'm not, that's not what I'm, what I'm saying at all. Uh, but anyways, I hope that you understood what I've said. I hope that that helps you think about things in a new light. Um, and uh, remember that, that people who are caught in sin are very much so caught, and they need your help, not your judgment. They probably already know that what they're doing is wrong. Probably. So, um, we're going to stop there. Next week's lesson is, or next lesson is about responsibility, um, responsible living, that kind of stuff. And the one right after it's conscience. They, they, they're very closely related, but also different. Um, conscience is more about resolving conflicts and uh, doing the right thing, whereas responsibility is more about um, the attitude that you live your life in. Um, and then I think the, the lesson after that, at the, I think it's the lesson after that, um, is about lifestyle, where we're going to talk about, you know, uh, what, what should I do and what should I not do, that kind of stuff. Um, well, I hope this lesson has been, been helpful for you. Um, I'll see you.